Thanks for joining us on Wellness Talk Radio. I'm Chris Costello, and today we are talking with Dr. David Agus. So, Dr. Agus, you've written The Lucky Years, How to Thrive in the Brave New World of Health, and it's a fascinating book. Well, thank you. Yeah, no, I'm very excited. I mean, this is something that I truly believe in, that we're in an amazing time in history where progress after progress is coming and we can all benefit. The things that you talk about are just, you know, you talk about being able to edit your DNA and using technology, and that was one of the most fascinating things. But I, I want to ask you first, though, how did you come to, I mean, the title is so optimistic, The Lucky Years. And right now, I mean, you just, you hear so much about obesity, you know, one out of two of us are going to get cancer. How are we going to have the lucky years with all of this? Well, you know, I mean, I, I get the privilege of seeing it literally on a daily basis. You know, just a year ago, President Jimmy Carter, in his early 90s, says, I have skin cancer that went to the brain. And just several years prior, that was a death sentence. And then last week, he announces and says he's cancer-free, and he's not even receiving the treatment. Every cancer has a don't-eat-me signal on its surface. He got a medicine, which is on the market, and FDA approved, that blocked that don't-eat-me signal to allow his own immune system to actually come in and eat the cancer. No chemotherapy, no horrible toxic drugs, just unharnessing his own immune system to attack the cancer. These are the lucky years. I'm interested because you have a a very strong background, obviously, in technology, and you talk a lot about how important it is to meld both medicine and technology. How is technology going to help us, or how is it helping us now? I think it is. You know, you started the simple things like big data. All of a sudden, every time we go to a doctor's office or every time we start to collect information, we're going to use it to learn things. A study came out earlier this year showing that if you have ovarian cancer, and you happen to be on a blood pressure drug called a beta blocker, which is a generic over-the-counter, I mean a generic drug, then uh, you lived four and a half years longer. We would have never known that from biology, but we pulled that from big data. A wild study came out of Europe showing that the closer you live to an airport, the higher the rate of brain decline as you get older, just implying that our brain needs quiet at night. So a big data study told us something about how we have to sleep. You know, I have a 150-pound dog that snores. So I wear those orange foam earplugs every night so I can get the quiet my brain needs. If you have a uh, snoring spouse, then I guess that goes for them too, huh? Uh, no question about it. Obviously, it's a lot more political for me to blame the dog than my wife. But uh, no, it's, it allows me to do something that big data taught me. And the more we learn about it, we learn that every year you delay retirement, you reduce the incidence of Alzheimer's by almost 3%. So if you retire at age, say, uh, uh, 80 instead of 60, well, that's a 60% reduction in the incidence of Alzheimer's. You don't use it, you lose it is correct. And we started to learn that from big data studies. That's just the tip of the iceberg in terms of technology. You know, when you go to a doctor's office now, they collect your blood, they check your blood pressure, they do all these parameters, and a few days later they call you with all the data. Well, the new era is going to be you collect your own data. So instead of your doctor checking your blood pressure at 2 o'clock, you check it in the morning when you get up, at night when you go to bed, when you're upset after a phone call, with enough data, error goes away. You'll use a lab on a chip at home and collect your information from a prick in your finger. And all of that information will go to your doctor. So when you go, you can actually have a discussion and discuss what happened in your data and actually go back and forth rather than just being told over the phone what happened. And now you've been a cancer doctor for for a long time, right? For about 160 years, yes. Excellent, excellent. Okay. Well, that leads me to my next question, which is, what is your goal now as a cancer doctor? So, So many things are changing in that whole field. Well, for the first time in my life, I can walk into a patient's room with a real sense of optimism. I still have patients who die of this horrible disease on a regular basis, but I can actually go in optimistic that I can make them live longer and better. And it's really two big areas. One is what we call personalized medicine. That is, every cancer patient, and this is covered by insurance now in most places, I can take a piece of their cancer from their biopsy and actually sequence the DNA and know the on and the off switches of their cancer. And there are dozens of drugs on the market now that target these on and off switches. So in a sense, I'm cheating. I'm knowing in advance what drug to give to the patient. And then the second is the Jimmy Carter treatment. 
is now routinely we can unharness the immune system to hopefully attack the patient's cancer. And we're seeing better and better data in this regard. It truly is an amazing time that our dream and our hope is to make this a chronic disease and to dramatically reduce the pain and the suffering with cancer. And I really believe it's starting to happen. Is your average person that goes to an oncologist going to get that kind of treatment, or how does that work? Well, the drugs are on the market. They're covered by insurance. And in today's world, I know people get upset when I say this, but you're in charge of your own health. So I want, if you're diagnosed, that to read about it. You know, read about what's going on so you can have a discussion and sometimes push your doctor. You know, the average physician, and I'm one of them, stubborn as anything, pig-headed like you wouldn't believe, but the average physician takes on average about 12 to 13 years for half of them to adopt a new technology. So we're slow to do new things. Sometimes you need to push a little, but they are available. And that's the cool thing to me is that in these lucky years, all of these new advances are really available to people, whether you're rich or poor, old or young, um, or wherever you live. It really is one of the great equalizers, these new technologies in healthcare. One of the things that you talk about is is the danger of reductionist thinking in medicine. And I'm curious, why why is that so dangerous? Historically, you know, an experiment happened in the 1920s that changed everything. And it's a wild experiment. They took a piece of bread, they dipped it in water, and they put it on people who had a cut on their leg. And half the people, they left it open to the air. So the people with the moist bread on their leg healed twice as fast, and it spawned germ theory. Right, The bread made mold, the mold made penicillin, and it killed the bacteria so it healed quicker. And then we used to think everything in the human body is like that. You look under the microscope, know what you're going to treat, you can fix it easy. Well, the problem is if you're going to drive from L.A. to San Francisco, you take apart a car and look at every piece of the car, it doesn't tell you how long it takes to get there. You forgot the weather, the traffic, the bladder size of the driver, how much caffeine the driver drank. They all matter. And in medicine, we keep looking at that car and taking it apart. We forget to look at the whole system. You know, infectious diseases from without, human disease, Alzheimer's, cancer, heart disease are from within. And so many times you don't have to understand a complex emergent system. In fact, they're impossible to understand most of the time to control it. And so the challenge now is to start to control it and to look at data. When a number is low on a lab value, it doesn't mean that you need to give something to replace it necessarily, but it's telling you part of a story. So over and over again, we see it. You know, in our country, you know, we're checking vitamin D levels on everybody, yet there's no data that giving vitamin D actually helps. So that reductionist view of there's too low a number here, let me give a, a, something to fix it, it actually turns out to hurt in many cases. Women over the age of 70 who take a high dose of vitamin D increase a decrease, increase the rate of bone fractures by 26%. So we need to get away from that. We need to look at that whole picture and look at the data. Right, and that's kind of another thing that you say in the lucky years uh, is that, that how dangerous misinformation can be. It's wild. I mean, a recent study came out showing that over 90% of studies in the medical literature are proven incorrect. So the challenge is knowing what to believe. The challenge is having a filter because much of what you see in the media just isn't correct. You know, a great study that I love to talk about came out earlier uh, last year where they said in the headlines of every newspaper said, well, meat can cause cancer. And if you looked at the data, up to three servings a week of meat had no negative effects at all. And in fact, if you had a processed meat every day for 20 years, so a hot dog a day for 20 years, you increase your rate of colon cancer from 4% to 5%. So it's true that meat could cause cancer, but if you look at the context and the information, it wasn't relevant to most people. By the way, if you're eating a hot dog every day for 20 years, there's probably other things wrong with you, too. We're talking with Dr. David Agus, author of The Lucky Years, How to Thrive in the Brave New World of Health. You're listening to Wellness Talk Radio. Go to wellnesstalkradio.com to find out more. So, Dr. Agus, we've been talking about how there's a lot of misinformation and so many of the studies are wrong. How do people know what to do? To me, it's having a filter. And so the filter, you know, I do the CBS morning show several days a week. Why? Because uh, part of my job is to be a filter, to filter things. And if you hear about something and you're not seeing it in places like the New York Times or on the, the network TV shows, then it probably isn't true. And so you need to start to use that filter. If a study is in New England Journal of Medicine and involves thousands of people, 
It's very different than a study in a medical journal you've never heard of involving a dozen people. And so you have to start to read the actual information, not just the headlines, and then use a filter that is use trusted sources to help with that information. Right now, it's the only way. You know, Hippocrates, 2,400 years ago, said you take the bark of the willow tree and chew it, and pain and fever go away. Well, that's where we got aspirin. And so over and over, much of the stuff that's, you know, folklore, if you will, is based on some real truth. The challenge is distilling it, finding what's real and what's not. You've done tons of research. You, you've practiced for years. You've written books, been physician to people like Steve Jobs, and, you know, you, you know everybody, all the high-tech people. But what would you yourself do if you suddenly had a cancer diagnosis? What, what, what would the steps be that you would take? So, you know, if one is diagnosed with cancer or really any disease, the first thing is gather up all your information. So you're going to need second opinions. You're going to need to pre- prevent things, you know, show people information. The challenge is getting it. When a well, biopsy was done at one hospital, a scan in another hospital, labs in another, many times hard to pull together. But pull that all together and put it in a place in the cloud where you can access it wherever you are. The second is, is figure out, you know, where your, the NCI-designated cancer centers are nearest you. Across our country, the National Cancer Institute has designated certain centers of what they call quality. And these National Cancer Institutes have some of the best doctors in the world for treating cancer. And so it doesn't mean you need to be treated there. Many times you live too far away. But certainly getting an opinion from one can be very helpful And then you can be treated locally, but you've got a team. The team is the local physician who classically is a generalist. So they see everything, and they can be very good at treating things. And then a specialist is someone who just treats the cancer that your body part, you know, so whether it be prostate, lung, breast, someone who really only does that at one of the cancer centers. And together, that's how you can get the best care. But really, you need to understand it and be in charge of it, is you are the advocate of you. So I'm really a fan of people reading information and bringing it in and discussing it. Because I want you to understand what's going on, why it's happening, and what's happening next. And some of it is just from a practical standpoint. I mean, what is what is the average uh, physician's patient load these days? Well, you know, there are high numbers. In a, you know, in one sense, it doesn't matter. Is that the great physicians, and there's an art to being a doctor. It's not just doing things the textbook says, but the great physicians, in many cases, the higher the volume, the better the art. The more you do something, the more you see of it, many times, the better you're going to be at doing it. So I don't mind the volume, but what I want is the time there being quality time. I want you to go in really knowing, and you've collected all your information about yourself, so you can really just spout off what went on in the last time since your last visit. You can say, I've heard about this. What do you think? You can really know and use that time in a quality sense instead of having your doctor explain from the ground up what's going on because it's not going to be that the information won't be as robust as if you go in knowing something. And again, we speak in a strange language. We like to use these many syllable words that are not that complex, although they sound more complex than they are, but it's hard, but I really want people to be educated walking in. How do people navigate? Uh, you know, there's so much information now about alternative therapies, and there are some treatments that are even being mixed with conventional treatments, such as uh, uh, acupuncture for neuropathy after chemo and things like that. But how does a person navigate, you know, what is safe, what isn't safe to do when you're being treated for uh, an illness? Oh, it's, it's difficult. I mean, the first is data. Everything you do, ask, is there a study showing there's a benefit? Because many times there can be harm. Many of the supplements people take can either use the same enzymes to degrade them as the chemotherapy drug. So they may raise the level of the drug, increasing toxicity, or lower it so it doesn't work very well. And so the challenge is is to tell your doctor everything you're doing. Don't hide anything. And at the same time, before you do something, really look and say, is there data that it can be used with the drug that I'm getting? Is there data that it actually does something positive? Don't just believe something on the Internet or somebody told you. Actually ask for that data. And what do you think about nutrition and things like that for treatment of cancer? We've been to several conferences and things that say that that is one way to go. What what, what are your thoughts on that? Well, you, treating cancer with nutrition makes no sense. I mean, certainly, I believe in good nutrition. We all should do it. It's an adjunct to treatment. But treating cancer with nutrition only, you know, ask Steve Jobs, it didn't work. You know, the challenge is to use both together, is to use a diet that actually gives you the best shot 
of the drugs you're having working and is best for your health. Sometimes that requires a little bit of personalization. And at the same time, you, you know, doing the therapy that we know will have a benefit for the disease you have. You know, many times people like to listen to the hyperbole they see on the Internet. Well, I cured my cancer by taking this kind of oil or this extract from, you know, a, a, a particular plant. And if those really worked and it was the case, we'd all be doing it. And so, again, I really want people to be critical and say, where's the data in the published literature that it worked? If it's not there, it's probably not real. And if people want to look into the published literature, where, where do they go? You can Google the word to PubMed, P-U-B-M-E-D, and uh, the NIH put together a data set of every published paper. So you could put in a keyword. You could put in a word that whatever thing you're talking about, a particular kind of treatment or an uh, herbal remedy, and then put prostate cancer or lung cancer and see the papers that come up. And you could start to see what worked and what didn't work. So it's all available. It takes a little bit of work, but it's worth it. And we're talking with Dr. David Agus, author of The End of Illness, A Short Guide to a Long Life, and The Lucky Years. So, Dr. Agus, I do want to just touch on a little bit uh, this, this concept of how important technology is in, in the future of medicine. How important is technology now? But technology certainly is transforming all of us. You know, earlier this year, there was an announcement about a, a particular molecule called CRISPR, C-R-I-S-P-R. And this was a molecule that can change one letter of the three billion letters of DNA. It was Molecule of the Year in Science Magazine, which I know all your listeners are following intently who the Molecule of the Year was. But what's powerful about it is that in China, they've already used it to change an embryo. They're creating mosquitoes now that are resistant to Zika with this technology. You can conceivably correct a child who has a particular genetic defect with this technology. And so all of a sudden, we can use technology to change things in a positive way. At the same time, we, as world scientists and world doctors, need to work together so that it's used correctly. And that the power of these technologies is used to benefit people and used appropriately. And so the balancing act is difficult, but it really is an amazing time for these kinds of things. As we mentioned before, you, you were Steve Jobs' physician, and uh, I guess you came on board a couple of years into his illness, uh, his cancer. Could it have been different had you gotten on board earlier? I, I, I don't know the answer. Um, you know, I got about a year after Steve was diagnosed, and it was a privilege to be involved. There was a team of people taking care of him, and I was one of the people on the team. And, you know, I treasured every moment. And, you know, one thing really stands out is once, you know, Steve's cancer was progressing, and he looked me in the eye and he goes, David, why can't you debug me like my engineers debug an Apple program? And it really was an amazing way of looking at whether it be cancer in the human body. And, you know, I wish we could debug something. I wish it was just one line in a code that I could change and make a disease go away. And so it really kind of opened my eyes to thinking at things differently. And Steve Bush, you know, again, he was one of those people who was empowered. He knew and became an expert in every area of the cancers he was dealing with. So when we had conversations, they were pretty high level. And he lived much longer than most p pancreatic cancer patients, right? Yeah, and, you know, he called it jumping lily pads and lily pads. Every time his cancer progressed, he was swimming in the pond. Mm -hmm. Once we used technology to sequence his cancer and identify a target with the drug, he was safe on a lily pad. And that's right. such a beautiful way of putting it, jumping lily pad to lily pad. You know, what we know is the best diet, and this really goes whether it be for cancer, heart, heart disease, as others, is a Mediterranean diet. So it's a good fat, not a low fat, but it's a Mediterranean diet. Quality of life is so important. No, and that's my goal, to reduce suffering. I mean, we can't cure all disease, but I could certainly make it so people live better. One of the things in the lucky years, you, you talk about wanting to, or being able to turn cancer into a manageable condition that you can live with indefinitely. And I certainly think we can with this immunotherapy and personalized medicine, molecularly targeted therapy. We are doing much better about allowing people to live with cancer. Great. And Dr. Agus, uh, where can people find you? I know they're going to want to uh, get themselves a copy of The Lucky Years and uh, find out more about what you're doing. I'm at the University of Southern California as a physician, and davidagus.com. You can find information about some of the things we've talked about. And then certainly The Lucky Years is available everywhere across the country, and we'd love people to read it and learn about the sense of optimism and hope that I have for what's going on in medicine and health. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. It's a privilege.